Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, Monday, April 20th, 2020. Now, as a daily news show, the timing of when we write and when we record sometimes means that we miss stories in the moment while they're happening. This happened to us on Friday when um, I knew as we were going live that this announcement had taken place, but I just didn't quite get it into our script and completely forgot to say it. On Friday, May 20, uh, on Friday, whatever Friday's date was, April 17th, uh, Jim Bridenstein announced that on May 27th, NASA is going to be launching two astronauts aboard a Falcon Crew Dragon on a mission to the International Space Station. Now, our current pandemic means that no one from CosmoQuest will be there live to cover the event. But we're going to do absolutely everything we can to bring you all the details as we know them right here on Twitch.tv. So, um, yeah, one small thing to really look forward to. Now, um, to use Jim Bridenstine's often used phrase, what this means is NASA will once again launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. But we just want to say that the way we think of this is, oh, cool, a new rocket launching new humans from an old place that we could drive to if it was not pandemic times. This is all kind of cool. As always, space is everyone's. Musk is a South African. His team and the NASA team both include lots of people from many different nations from around the world who have all in one way or another ended up working either for collaborating companies in other countries or working here in the United States because, well, this is a pretty good place to work on getting to outer space. So, um, yeah, go little rocket, go. In other news... Coming to you from right here at the Planetary Science Institute, um, scientists have discovered that the same effects that weather the surface of the moon also work to erode away the surface of the asteroid 433 Eros. Shown in this image is a topographic map where the different colors indicate the different heights from the surface, where the average height of the surface is in yellow, blue is deep, pink is high. Um, What this team has learned and published in a new paper in the journal Icarus with lead author James Richardson is that the study fall of tiny asteroids and other debris from outer space against the surface of an asteroid works to round down the edges and actually erase craters that are already there. This happens in two different ways. The easiest to understand way is this steady stream of impacting material. Well, wherever it hits, it crushes what it hits, turning rocks into regolith, and otherwise literally melts away structures on the surface, the same way rain will erode away an adobe wall that hasn't been baked. Now, the other way that these impacts can affect things is through seismic tremors. When an object hits the asteroid, it sets the entire thing shaking ever so slightly. And this has the same effect as tapping the side of a container that has flour in it to level out the flour. Those seismic motions just ever so gradually shake away surface features. This well, packs a one-two punch that has the effect that over time, the sharp edges of fresh craters, well, they wear away as they're no longer quite so fresh. Um, yeah, asteroids are shaken, not stirred. Now, objects colliding and breaking apart is really just the way of things here in our solar system. From Eros's impacts, we now switch gears to look at the crumbling comet 2I Borisov. As this object has passed near the sun, it has begun to break apart. But 
while it was still one piece, this comet already had a comet tail and a coma of materials that were released as volatiles. Um, all those ices rearing up to become gas, as all those volatiles sublimated away, this dust, gas, and other materials can all be measured spectroscopically by pointing, well, in this case, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array at the, teles at the comet and using the telescope to measure the specific wavelengths of light that correspond to carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide. Now, this was done on December 15th, 16th, and the astronomers who looked at the chemical composition of Borisov found in results now published in the journal Nature that comet Borisov has a completely normal amount of hydrogen cyanide, but is unusually rich in carbon monoxide. And this seems to imply that this comet, origin which originated in a completely different solar system, um, must have formed someplace significantly colder than where comets come from in our solar system. Basically, what they found was hydrogen cyanide, normal amount, carbon monoxide, significantly larger amount. And since carbon monoxide freezes at a, such a low temperature, this implies that wherever it formed had to have been cold enough to form large amounts of carbon monoxide. Now, while it's not possible to speculate too scientifically, we just don't have a lot of data about the origins of Comet Borisov. This kind of composition is consistent with Borisov coming from the kinds of solar systems that we're starting to find using the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. These are systems that have extremely extensive disks of material around them and uh, our systems with low mass stars not too distant from our own sun. So it's quite possible that, well, the same kinds of systems that we're watching form may be throwing rocks our way. Now, until we find more interstellar comets, we're not going to know if this kind of, well, overabundance of carbon monoxide is the norm or the exception. We don't know if our solar system behaved like everyone else or if the one where Borisov formed behaved like everyone else, or if maybe this is just one of those things that is completely random from system to system. For now, we're going to enjoy Borisov's shattered departure from our solar system and just keep looking for more icy alien visitors that, well, we can probe for their compositions. In our final story of the day, we have a pretty picture. In this case, this is the California Nebula as viewed with like just a normal backyard style telescope. Now, when you zoom in on this nebula in the section with the rectangle using Spitzer Space Telescope, you see something entirely different, and that something entirely dis different includes a fairly significant background galaxy. That's what's in this little tiny red circle here. Now, back at the very beginning of February, we shared with you with sadness that the Spitzer Space Telescope, having outlived its intended life by roughly a decade, um, it was finally decommissioned. This is the final set of images taken with that telescope. And the other thing we told you was we're going to keep using that data for years, decades to come to keep learning about our solar system, our galaxy, and the universe beyond. And this is one of those days when that data is telling us something new. This little galaxy could never be seen before. Because, well, we just hadn't pointed an infrared telescope at this part of the sky for long enough before. Dust has the habit of, in general, unless it's super special dust, like comes from Betelgeuse that we talked about on Friday, dust in general blocks blue wavelengths. It blocks visible wavelengths. But 
reds and infrared light, the further you get towards the red, the longer your wavelengths, the more light comes out and hits a detector. So with the Spitzer Space Telescope working in those infrared wavelengths, we were able to see through the California Nebula and literally see a galaxy hiding behind it. This is kind of cool. And I look forward to many more decades of seeing what new discoveries are hiding like that galaxy, just waiting to be seen. And that's all we've got for today. Now stick around, I will be answering your questions. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to remind you, this episode of The Daily Space was written by me, Dr. Pamela Gay, and will be produced by Susie Murph. The Daily Space is a production of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system and beyond. We are here thanks to you, your donations, your bits, your subs, your patronage at patreon.com. All of these things allow us to pay our staff a wage that is getting them through these pandemic times. Thank you for everything you do. Because of you, there are a few more people that don't have to seek unemployment. So thank you. Now, we are seeing a dramatic decrease in donations. And what this tells me is a lot of you are struggling. And we just want you to know we're here for you. Come hang out with us in Discord. If you need something to fill your day, we have volunteer tasks. And we'd love your help. And just know that we have pretty much perpetual games of Ticket to Ride going. And if you just want to lurk and play a game, that's okay too. We will get through this virus. No matter how long it takes, we're going to get through it together. All right. So I'm now going to check out your questions. And I'm going to put up this particularly pretty larger scale image of the California Nebula to do that. All right, so let's see what all we have got. Um, so uh, Veronica Cure asks, what makes it a background galaxy? Um, it's literally just the terms stolen from like art and photography where the things that are in front are called foreground and the things that are behind are called background. So in this case, the California Nebula is your foreground object. Um, but if I switch over and I look through all that dust and gas, the stuff behind the dust and gas is the background object. Now, what is foreground and what is background all depends on where you have focused. Um, there are lots and lots of times when larger on the sky galaxies like this one are considered foreground galaxies when compared to the background of quasars and distant galaxies beyond. So just like the tree in your front yard might sometimes be the foreground object in your photo, whereas sometimes the moon is the foreground object compared to the stars. It's just a way of saying what is closer and further away in an image of many different things. All right, let's see what else is in here. Language is squishy. Language is very squishy. Um, so, so Limperimple asks, how about a sound telescope? So, so sound actually propagates in a completely different way than light. Um, light moves through space as a particle called a photon flies. These particles have wavelengths because quantum mechanics. And depending on the energy of the photon, it's always going to travel at the exact same speed, the speed of light. And when you have a photon with a lot of energy, it gets bluer and bluer going out through ultraviolet to x-ray to gamma ray as the energy in that photon gets less and less, you end up with a um, progressively lower and lower energy, redder and redder, longer wavelength um, photon. So um, sound, on the other hand, is compression waves. 
you are literally hearing when I speak to you, unless you're using bone conduction headphones. That all bones, all bets are off then. If you're using either regular headphones or speakers, um, the my voice is with my vocal cords shaking the air, that air that I'm shaking with my energy is then shaking the receiver in my microphone. And then the speaker cone in your speaker is getting shaken. So it's basically shaking stuff all the way down. Um, space doesn't have stuff. So we can, these kinds of waves that we hear are called compression waves. And we know there's compression waves in the, in the sun. If we could stick a microphone in the sun, we would hear it roar. But sound waves, you can't build a telescope to see those because vacuum of space. Um, it's just a different kind of wave. Let's see what else we have in here. Um, Spitzer was sent to space in 2003. Yeah, and I believe it was designed to be decommissioned in 2010. And it just kept going. So, so Raj Luther asks, why was Spitzer decommissioned? Um, it was old and struggling. And it was on a solar orbit that was carrying it further and further away from the Earth over time. So its orbit was just a snurt bigger than ours. This meant that it orbited just a little bit slower and over time drifted further and further away from the Earth in its orbit. Eventually, it'll catch up to us, but that's going to be a long time. For now, um, the amount of energy required for it to send systems, to send inst uh, images back to the planet Earth, that was just more energy than it necessarily had. Its batteries were beyond their lifetime. It was old. It was ready to be retired. Um, originally, it was hoped that the James Webb Space Telescope would launch in about 2011 and make Spitzer completely obsolete. Spitzer was designed to be the infrared telescope that kept us going until James Webb was up in orbit. But as James Webb hits the point of now looking at being an entire decade behind schedule, um, Spitzer just couldn't go any longer. Yeah. Sadness, sadness. Um, so Hannes Vorverb asks, would brown dwarfs have Oort clouds? So as near as we can tell, brown dwarfs, these failed stars at the 80 Jupiter mass-ish size, they appear to form just like stars do in their own collapsing cloud of dust and gas. And this implies that if there was enough mass in that system, um, they could form an Oort cloud. But the thing is, if there was enough mass in the system, you'd have something a whole lot bigger than a brown dwarf. Now, we don't know exactly what the cutoff size is between big enough to start forming worlds and Oort clouds and that sort of stuff. We need to find more of these things, look at them with the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. But um, there is a non-zero probability that brown dwarfs are just way too small to be able to form vast clouds like the Oort cloud. Now, they could have closer in clouds, think more like the Kuiper belt, more like the asteroid belt, but of ice. Um, so it would be structurally similar, but in a position that we're used to finding other things. Um, so AstroWise asks, if we have enough observation data points, can we track back where Borisov came from? Uh, we can track back what its trajectory was when it entered our solar system. The issue is everything is moving. And we don't necessarily have precise enough understandings of where other stars were however many years ago, decades, eons ago to be able to figure out exactly where it originated. Um, we don't have any solar systems close enough to have just flung it at us from the direction it came. So all that chaos of living in a galaxy filled with stars that are all orbiting, we just can't 
get there from here. Not enough data. It's too chaotic of a system. Um, looking to see what other questions we have here. Um, <laughs> Tropical Tom is like, after the show, can uh, anyone want to help an old boomer with his Twitch Prime? Um, okay, it, can someone at me and at Tropical Tom if they're able to help? Otherwise, um, I'll see what I can do. But I have to admit, I set it up a long time ago and don't remember how I did it. So if anyone has done it recently and can help Tropical Tom, please help Tropical Tom. Um, looking to see what else is in here. Okay. And I, I saw the comment on that, Jeff. Yes, I, this is so entirely the correct GIF, GIF, pick the pronunciation of choice to go along with this tweet. Um, yeah, it's happening. It's happening. All right, let me scroll down to the bottom and see what new things have come in while I was scrolling up. Um, thank you, Veronica, for helping. Thank you so much. Um, we don't have data from Elon's ago. Um, is that what I said? I didn't mean that to be what I said, but if it is, at least it was amusing. Um, oh, Tropical Tom, that is amazingly sweet. I'm so glad that you got, that you're here and, Please check out our community. Veronica, if you could help them like see where the Discord is and stuff, that would be amazing. Um, Veronica is one of our long-term community members and she's just a good human. And she's one of our survivors, we think of COVID because there aren't enough tests in this stupid country. She's a survivor, which makes her a superhero with superpowers. Um, looking to see what else is in here. <laughs> so astrowise there there used to be a jwst command and it basically said too soon just too soon um unfortunately we do have to sometimes talk about it it's the never-ending wait <sighs> um so Raj Luther asks, when Spitzer is close to the earth again, will it be used again? Its batteries won't be any good by that point. And hopefully by that point, we will be so much more of a spacefaring nation that we can go grab it and stick it in a museum. That would be my hope. Um, so Hanny asks, are gravitational waves compression waves? Oy. Um, sort of. But instead of being compression waves through a medium, they're a compression wave through the fabric of space. So sound waves uh, compress the gas, the rock, the whatever it is they're traveling through. Sound waves have to travel through something. A nebula can have a sound speed and sound waves. Um, it's such a diffuse gas that it will significantly affect the pitch. But um, with gravitational waves, it it is taking space, time, everything, and compressing it. So, yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> It's the one, I don't know why your internet cable isn't shaking. Um, the electromagnetic spectrum is fascinating. Um, I, I just appreciate the fact that at a certain point, we're just like, F it. It's gravity wave. It's, uh, sorry, it's gamma rays or it's radio waves. We're just going to stop naming things. And I don't think we have detectors that go like to infinity in either direction. So... We don't even know what the universe might be doing at the longest and shortest wavelengths of light. Um, 
So Tropical Tom asks, how big do dust particles have to be to block all light, all colors, instead of blocking just blue light? So the size of the particle affects what color is blocked. Um, and then it is the density of the particles that determines what um, fraction of the light gets through. And you just asked me something that I know was a homework problem I had in graduate school. I can like see the equations in my head, but um, I don't remember the answer. <laughs> so, so essentially, uh, once you start getting big old chonky dust particles, they block all colors of light equally. Once you get a dense enough fabric of chunky dust particles, then you block all the light. Um, the other way to do it is to just have, instead of the density per cubic meter, if you just have a big enough cloud. So there's, there's three different things you have to look at. One is what's called the column density. So how much of, of a length of, sorry, column density is how many particles per cubic meter. Then you have to look at the column length, which is how many of those cubic meters are you looking through? And then you have to look at particle size. So you can vary all three of those different things to block different wavelengths with different effectiveness to block all wavelengths, chunky dust particles. And yes, I did just use the word chunky many times. It doesn't only apply to cats. Um, let's see what else is in here. Okay, I caught up with where I started. Um, so Henny asks, if we could see the longest wavelengths, would it show us a more detailed cosmic microwave background or earlier in time? So we can't see earlier in time because the universe was just flat out opaque until the cosmic microwave background was formed. And the cosmic microwave background radiation is a specific wavelength that corresponds to the temperature the universe was at the moment the cosmic microwave background formed with that wavelength getting stretched out by the expansion of the universe. And it turns out as long as we're in orbit, we can see that wavelength perfectly well. Um, so I don't know exactly what we would be missing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Most people hear voices in their head, but astronomers are strange. They see equations in their head. Um, we also hear voices in our head. I I have a um, eidetic enough memory that I had one of my professors yell at me in graduate school for memorizing my notes and regurgitating them when she literally like she would ask a question exactly worded like an example she did on the chalkboard and I'd regurgitate the example she did on the chalkboard on my exams and it really pissed her off. Um, so I also have a terrible short-term memory due to lack of sleep and too much travel over the years. So it's not as powerful as it was in graduate school, but it's enough that like I can see the equations of my homework set that I did in graduate school. My brain is not a good place to be. Um, a chunky snert. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see anything else in here. Okay. Anyways, it only gets bad if your voices in your head hear voices. So when you were a little kid, all of you out there, did you ever like try and think about, okay, I'm thinking about what I'm saying and I'm thinking about what I'm thinking about what I'm saying and to try and figure out just how many layers you could go down? These are the things if you're a nerdy enough child, you tried. Do not try this at home unless you really want to hurt yourself. It's easy to sprain a brain. Um, <laughs> planetary pan is like it only gets bad when other people respond to the voices in your head that's true or when you realize you've just allowed one of the voices in your head to escape by saying things out loud um so yes anyways i need to go record this podcast and go get to work doing all the normal monday tasks that are around 
which apparently include, I have now destroyed two loaves of bread in the past. I'm really bad at baking bread, people. I make perfectly photogenic bread that you could kill somebody with. I have so far made two discuses of bread. I'm going to try a third loaf. Maybe it will go better. Anyways. Anyways. Um, I'm going to go attempt to make bread a third time. Battle bread. It is dwarven stone bread. Battle bread. Yes. Yes. <sighs> Ooh, bread pudding is an excellent idea. I hadn't thought of that. Um, okay. The hard dangerous bread is still good for soups. I need to like pull out a mallet to break this stuff apart. Cause like to try and cut off a piece of the second loaf to see if it was any better than the first, like the entire loaf was this tall. Um, I had to like completely lean on it with my um, bread knife with all my weight. I'm gonna have to find a mallet. Okay. Okay, so. Um, who is out there that we might raid? I am, as always, open to suggestions. All ideas are valid as long as they aren't adult content. Science content is always preferred. Um, weapons grade bread. Yes, I made weapons grade bread. Um, hardtack is a good word for it. Hardtack is definitely a good word for it. EJ. I will raid EJ. All right. So once again, I would like to remind you all that this has been The Daily Space. We um, are a production of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system and beyond. Today's episode was written by me, Dr. Pamela Gay, and will be produced by Susie Murph. We are here thanks to the generous contributions of people like you. Your bits, your subs, your patronage at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX allow us to keep going. So thank you. And if you're looking for other ways to get involved, there's lots you can do. And the easiest thing you can do is just share us out. Let your friends know, hey, there's this place where you can go learn a science. Anyways, that's all we've got for today. So wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon, and wash your hands and keep sheltering in place. Bye-bye.